Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Tom Gillis. I'm the CEO of a company called Bracket Computing. We make security software for hybrid clouds. Uh, I'm going to talk about some of the work we've been doing specifically with Cloud Foundry and really taking a new approach to uh, thinking about how we can secure workloads in the data center. So it's useful to take a step back and just think about uh, security in context. Um, I've been doing security for all my career, so uh, you can maybe tell from my gray hairs, that's many, many, many years, uh, measured in decades. Back when I was doing security, um, I was part of the founding team of a company called Ironport, which maybe some of you have heard of as an email security appliance. Back when we were doing that, uh, spam filter, right? Uh, the way security, wor uh, way uh, threats were working is they were largely based on, on large-scale attacks, email-based viruses that we would oftentimes see, you know, 100 million copies of the same email replicating across the internet. Um, and so the approach the industry took was, you know, we see a new attack, it's done at scale, they're relatively easy to detect because of, uh, you know, we use basically, you know, all kinds of fancy words, we call the bulk detection techniques, write a signature and stop it. And that, you know, was a pretty good approach. You, you know, you try to write that signature as fast as possible, and so you'd have like a certain number, you know, you know we got it down to like hours, it would take us hours to respond to a, to a new attack and stop it. But that means that some of the stuff is gonna bleed through, but you know, you're catching 99.9% .9 of it, and that was, that was fine. Um, what we have seen happen in the industry is that, that um, the stakes have raised and the attack techniques have changed. And so, so when you look at how effective some of these cyber attacks have been, you know, whether it's um, you know, exposing huge, huge amounts of financial information, um, you know, exposing, um, uh, you know, it's impacting politics, it's impacting you know, weapons systems, I mean, it's, it's, it's impacting the fate of nations. There's been a movement towards these focused attacks that have a population of one, right? So, so we have professional engineers that are designing exploits and attacks that, that have a population of one. And by definition, a signature-based system is not gonna um, be able to capture something that has a population of one. And so in these sophisticated attacks, what we see is, is there's one consistent thread, and that is persistence. So if you look at the Equifax attack, uh, HBO, Sony, the DNC, the one characteristic that all of these attacks have, have in common is that the attacker was able to reside in the uh, target network for periods of three, six, nine, even 12 months. And so just think about this for a second, you know, in kind of common sense terms. Imagine someone broke into your house and they stole your DVD player and ran. You'd be mad, right? Imagine someone broke into your house and they stayed there for a year. <laughs> you, you know, it'd be kind of weird, right? That's what's happening. So people are able to get into the network and they're able to stay in the network for these really, really long periods of time. Um, and this is an area that we've been focusing on is looking at how do we ensure that even if an exploit exists, because Software has bugs, right? It's always going to have bugs. Bugs equal exploits. Bugs are the, are the reason that why, bugs or, you know, the biggest bugs, of course, are humans that make mistakes. So there's always gonna be a way that an attacker is gonna find a way to get in the network. But the, the current thinking in security is, how do we make it so that they can't get a meaningful toehold? So let's look at, at what an attack sequence like um, Equifax the way it happened is there was a vulnerability in uh, Apache Struts, and you all probably know this. So there was actually two Apache Struts vulnerabilities. And the first one was, was announced, and I think it was like three or four months later, the second one was announced. And so the attackers found the first one. So it wasn't even like the new zero day. This was not a zero day at all. It was an unpatched server. And you know, I've, I've frequently been talking to customers to say, you know, why don't you patch? Well, patching is actually hard. Right? Patching breaks things sometimes. Uh, patching is, is very, very time consuming. And you know, the number of new exploits is like a 40 a day. Right? So you're constantly in the stream of constantly trying to keep up. The vast majority of people, even when they're totally on their game, are running servers that are sometimes unpatched. Um, so what these attackers did is they, they found this vulnerability in struts that allowed them to spawn a root shell. And once they, once they get root, now they're in the OS. Now they can download a toolkit, install a rootkit, embed themselves in the OS. And even when you run antivirus scans and you know, some you know, fairly you know, next-gen security tools, pretty much when an attacker gets root, it's over. Like it's very, very hard to unroot them out of, out of a server. Uh, and so then they move laterally, right? I own this one server and then they start probing the network and finding other places to go, find other vulnerabilities, attack, get root, persist, and they move and spread, spread through the network 
ultimately looking for data, right? At the end of the day, that's, that's what they're there for. But if you think about a large, complex organization, um, you know, you're not going to find the data you want on a random data volume or a random database, right? It takes a while to probe around and find all the different servers and, and, and look at what, what uh, to, to navigate through what might be out there. A lot of times they don't know what they're looking for. They're looking for something interesting or something valuable. And so persistence is the tool that allows them to, to achieve that. So what we've realized is that when an attacker gets root, right, root means that's the core privilege of the OS itself. And so in the case of Apache Struts, the OS marks critical parts of the system call table and critical parts of the kernel as you know, read-only or to be protected. But that marking and that, that, that enforcement is done by the OS, which has you know, the same as root. So once you have root on a system, you can do whatever you want. And so the OS can't stop itself. You know, root can't stop root. And this is what we see happening, is that the attackers will come in. Uh, in the case of the DNC attack, they came in and they, they were able to not disable antivirus. They were able to spoof antivirus. So that antivirus was thinking, oh, I'm getting these updates and everything's good. I always joke that like, you know, when antivirus is running in user space and an attacker has root, antivirus will ask the operating system, you know, hey, have you seen any malware? And the operating system, which has the malware running in it, will reply in a Russian accent, no, comrade, there's no malware here. And antivirus says, oh, thank you, thank you very much. Um, uh, so, so traditional approaches, agent-based approaches to security, um, you know, have this vulnerability of that. You can't, you know, trying to enforce security when an attacker has root is very, very difficult. So we had this idea like, well, geez, what if we could take security and pull it out of the OS and put it into a virtualization layer? And so what we did is we created a virtualization that, layer that we call a metavisor. And the metavisor is a very, very thin, very small hypervisor that's attached to every host. So don't think of it as like a, a VMware or Amazon hypervisor that's spreading many, many VMs across, across a big cluster of machines. This little thing is designed to be like a shim that attaches to the host. So it's a one-to-one -one relationship with a host, but it's not running in the host. It's running in a separate memory space. And so, so it's extremely strong. And even if an attacker gets root access, it can't turn us off. So this is particularly relevant in the Cloud Foundry context because this architecture doesn't require any changes to the, to the application or to the OS. All you do is you boot the, the you, you wrap the images so that the metavisor boots first and then we chain load the stem cells or the Diego cells up on top of us. And so from the standpoint of the, the, the application that's running, your Cloud Foundry application, you don't even know we're there, but we're there. So on top of this platform, we've implemented three different types of services. We have a product that we call ServerGuard, we have a product that we call uh, NetworkGuard, and DataGuard. ServerGuard is the capability that, that actually enforces immutability in a production system. That's what I'm going to focus on in this talk. NetworkGuard does network segmentation and encryption uh, transparently, right? Remember the, the app, the Cloud Foundry app, has no idea that we're doing that, but we can, we can do encryption and segmentation and firewalling with stateful firewall underneath the Cloud Foundry application. Um, and it's, you know, we've worked very hard to make that, seamless, that integration seamless. And the data guard is encryption of data at rest and also some pretty interesting controls about data at rest, ensuring uh, uh, boot integrity, et cetera. So one of the interesting things about this architecture is that it enables the traditional separation of duties model. So if you all have been in an enterprise environment, enterprises have, you know, for like decades, organized around the idea that you've got app, app development teams, you've got operations teams, and you have a separate security team. And the controls always enabled this. A firewall was a device that, the, that could be inserted in the infrastructure and the, the, the didn't slow the app guys down at all, but you had a separate set of folks that would be, make sure that all the ports are, are closed and you know, we're running things in a secure way. And the reason you do that is, is so you have accountability. Um, in the self-service DevOps world, that line gets very blurry. And so this architecture restores that separation of duties model where a security team can go in and say, look, no matter what a developer does in their Cloud Foundry deployment, I can guarantee that data is always encrypted all the time, that a development environment never touches production, that a production environment never touches development, um, uh, that data residency requirements are met, and that even if my Cloud Foundry stem cells aren't necessarily patched or up to date, that you know, they are protected in a way that an attacker can't achieve persistence, can't take root on, on the system. 
And that's a very, very compelling idea. Um, so I'm going to talk specifically about how we can achieve immutability uh, for either a stem cell or for Diego cells running in production. Um, um, so oftentimes, as I talked about, an attack sequence will say, find a vulnerability in a piece of code, Apache. Um, they will uh, uh, use that to launch a shell. So they'll launch a shell, and then they'll escalate privileges. And so, so you know, um, the way we, the approach we have is I imagine there's this list of, I call it the list of things that should never change and the list of things that should never happen, okay? Things that should never change, critical parts of the kernel of that running cluster should never be modified. And probably one of the most clear examples of this is the system call tables. So when that attacker achieves escalated privileges, they will download a Linux kernel rootkit that allows them to patch the system call table. When you've patched the system call table, you can't see the processes, these malware processes that are running. So they're hidden from a process inspection. Even though the processes are still running in the OS, they're hidden from any kind of scanning. So it makes it very, very difficult. This is the point I've said, like to the point of you know, nearly impossible to be able to discern this without using forensics tools like uh, memory dump. Um, so what we focus on is we look for those critical parts of memory when the server boots and we map them. We say this, this part here is the system call table. The OS is calling it read-only, but the OS can't stop a root process from modifying that read-only memory. But since we're a hypervisor, we're running in a different privilege level of the, of the uh, Intel processor. So we run in ring zero, and the actual application, and the OS is running in ring three. So we can say, you know what, we're going to make sure that this, this memory section is, in fact, uh, read-only and cannot be modified. And so if an attacker does modify it, we then have a policy-driven response that can say, Take a memory dump, um, isolate this, this instance, or just simply deny the action. Like, sorry, you know, I know you're trying to patch the system call table, but you can't. We do the same thing for files. So a very simple, uh, it's almost like common sense security algorithm says, executable code should be executed, but not written to, ever, on a production server, right? You can do this, you can have a different set of policies for dev or staging, but in a production server, executable code you know, can, be, can be executed, but not modified. Configuration files can be read but not executed. Um, and log files can be written to but, um, but not executed. And so, and in fact, we can even say that log files shouldn't even be read. That's a switch. Um, uh, and so that very simple algorithm allows us to map and control the file system so that if an attacker is trying to, to embed themselves into your images by modifying the system files, we can deny that. Um, and this is a very, very useful tool. It also, we have demos where we show an attacker could go in and try to like, you know, delete uh, a kernel module and the OS will respond back, sorry, can't do it because we're enforcing that at the hypervisor level, right? At the metavisor, we can deny those read actions by protecting um, processes that are running in memory as well as the files that are residing on disk. We also look at privilege escalations. So if there's a process that's running in user space, we track and are aware of all of these different processes and so if we see a process running in user space that suddenly escalates to root without doing a set UID, that's something that should never happen, but it's a very common attack technique. And so what you can see we can do with this capability is, is you know, this is particularly relevant for container-based applications because the runtime is not meant to be customized. It's not meant to be heterogeneous. It's meant to be extremely deterministic and should never be changed. And so if you think about uh, uh, attacks as a funnel, the, the front of the funnel are exploits. There's literally millions of them, millions of things that we don't even know about, things that we do know about and we're struggling to fix and patch, we the kind of you know, security industry and software industry. Right? So, so, so trying to plug all those holes is a very, very difficult task. And as I talked about in the opening, it's not one that's really readily achievable. Um, but if you look at the techniques that attackers use once they have an exploit, it's a much smaller number of techniques. It's like 40, right? It's, it's a very finite and deterministic number of things. And that's where we're focused on, is, is preventing an attacker from taking a hold of you know, modifying the system configuration in a way that allows them to persist. So we assume that exploits exist and attackers are going to get in, but we don't let them stay in. Um, and so, so we can do this for, for the stem cells, for the Diego cells, for all the different processes that are running. Um, uh, in your Cloud Foundry deployment. Now we also do um, uh, micro-segmentation, you know, which is sort of the fancy word for firewalling. 
um, uh, and it's all tag based. So the idea is that you could say, these um, stem cells are gonna be in my development environment, and so I'm gonna allow people to get in, and I'm gonna allow them to modify things. Like if someone's patching the kernel there, we might note it, we wanna log it. Like that's weird, they probably shouldn't be doing that, but we'd, we would allow it in a development environment. But in a prod environment, we would not allow that, right? So, so you can have a separate set of rules in prod. So your prod policy could be block all unused ports, um, uh, turn server guard into enforcement mode, um, quarantine a suspect workload. So if we see someone modifying something in the OS, the, the most robust response is not to kill it, but to actually take it off the network. So we'll remove network connectivity so they can't actually get to any interesting data, but allow the attack to run and turn on high fidelity logging and uh, um, uh, things like memory dumps, right? So we can actually take a memory capture of a Cloud Foundry workload running out on Amazon that's based on an event. So it's an event-driven memory capture, which is pretty interesting. Um, we do have a similar approach for um, data at rest. So we have the ability to encrypt all different data types. So we can encrypt all block data. Uh, we encrypt boot disks. So the actual stem, stem, stem cells themselves, you have a master image, a gold image that comes out of your concourse pipeline. As a step in concourse, we will encrypt those images and then deploy them in an encrypted format when we go to boot them, it's authenticated encryption, which means no one has tampered with or modified those images. So you know you're getting a clean boot to begin with, and then we put the protections in place to, to guarantee that the thing stays clean throughout the life cycle of, of the machine. Um, uh, the most relevant use of data, of course, data encryption is for the data set itself and persistence. And there we cover block storage, uh, local storage on the, on the machine, or in Amazon parlance we call ephemeral storage. Um, uh, we also intercept S3, so we can do object storage um, with a, an HTT proxy, so that if a machine is trying to access data that it's not supposed to have access to, those accesses would just be denied. Um, as an interesting little side benefit that you get out of this is you probably read about, or maybe you didn't read about, but if you uh, didn't, you should. Um, there's been a series of, of data breaches that were simply involving misconfiguration of uh, S3 object stores. So if, you, if you're an Amazon user, S3 is like one of the most powerful, incredible services. My guys use it all the time. Part of what makes it so powerful is it's so easy to use, and it's literally one button that says publish to the internet. And that button can be inherited. So if someone chooses, oh, I'm going to publish to the internet, and then someone else copies some data and moves it into a different data set, the whole thing is published on the internet. So there's been a number of examples of companies that have put uh, uh, secret data from the government, customer credit card information, um, et cetera. One of the big telcos published six million credit card numbers um, just by inadvertently misconfiguring S3 and publishing to the internet. With our crypto solution, remember that separation of duties model, we're able to encrypt the data so that even if a developer misconfigures and publishes to the internet, they're publishing encrypted data and the customer controls the keys, so no data would actually be, re be released. So it's, it's a way to provide checks and balances on a, a dev and ops team that's moving very quickly, and you know, maybe they're doing something late at night and they make a configuration error. The security team has the ability to guarantee that these security policies are always met, um, uh, regardless of what dev and ops do. Um, so, so the way the system works, the, the policy is all built on key release. So when we're encrypting the data, um, we maintain the keys in a central uh, key server that's backed by an HSM, which is a hardware security module. Um, it's a very mature, very proven piece of uh, security technology. And so when uh, a server goes to attach to a data volume, um, the metavisor will say, oh, this is encrypted, I need a key. It reaches back to the policy server and says, hey, I need a key to decrypt this data volume. Before we release the key, we say, okay, we're gonna allow you to read this, but we have some questions, first of all. Who are you, right? So the, the questions would show up here, oops. Um, uh, so we'll check, you know, this data is supposed to be PCI data. Is this a PCI application that's reading it? Is it touching the internet, yes or no? Is it, uh, if it has a residency requirement, is this in the US or is this not in the US, et cetera? All of those policies can be enforced at the point of key release, which is a very, very effective form of doing policy enforcement because we don't in any way rely on IP address or any infrastructure parameters, right? We're entirely looking at logical controls, which can be um, uh, compliant with these, these policy languages. So this architecture is inherently designed to scale across multiple clouds um, because 
we're, we're, the, the virtualization is actually nesting on top of the virtualization of the various cloud providers. So this runs on a VMware-based private cloud. It runs on Amazon, it runs on Google, it runs on Microsoft. Uh, very much architecturally aligned with Pivotal Cloud Foundry. Um, and as I said, it sort of transparently sl snaps underneath it. And so it's a very easy and very effective way to enforce uh, security policies on your applications that are spanning multiple clouds. Um, we also act as a NetFlow collector and a NetFlow aggregator. So, so we look at flow data and we give you graphs that allow you to uh, see what's happening in the network. Um, if you've ever had an experience visualizing NetFlow data, I worked at Cisco for years, um, if you're operating even at modest scale, it turns into a big jumble of stuff. And so the tags add a huge amount of value here where you'd say, instead of looking at just a million different flows, you can say, I wanna look at my app. And so all the tags that are you know, tagged called app or payments, um, you can look at a payments application. It'll say, oh, I've got you know, a payments app maybe on the left and on the right is my, is my processing app and I can see the flows, it'll consolidate multiple instances down to one, and then you can click, it's an interactive diagram, so you can click on a particular edge or particular cluster, and you can look at the details of individual flows. Um, we also capture block flows, which is pretty interesting. Um, so this is, these are real screenshots from, uh, from the UI. We left some security groups open, and you know, within hours, the bots are all pounding on these machines, and so you can see flows that are being blocked, but it's also a very handy tool for troubleshooting uh, flows if you're doing a multi-cloud deployment across, say, Amazon, but your persistence layer is on-prem. That can be a difficult uh, troubleshooting uh, uh, use case, and we give you complete visibility into those flows across infrastructure. Last thing is that security is, um, I wouldn't say it's not important, but the, the most important thing of security is provability. You gotta be able to show this to an auditor. Um, and so we've been able to, to uh, create reports that, that show this provability. In fact, one of the things that we've done, which I think is particularly relevant, is we have a, a big uh, mortgage uh, provider customer that we're working with where we can run PCI compliant workloads and non-PCI compliant workloads on the same foundation. And this is a big deal because without that, the customer is gonna have to build a whole nother foundation and have a whole nother set of hardware. And so we're able to provide cryptographic isolation between a PCI and non-PCI workload on the same foundation, and the reports allow an auditor to say, oh, I can clearly see these are isolated cryptographically from the other ones. Um, and so we've been working with the QSA, which is the auditing firm um, that can guarantee that these things are PCI compliant. So uh, in summary, what we work on is immutable security, right? So the security itself can't be turned off, even if an attacker has root access. It's transparent to the dev and ops teams, very much aligned with PCI, uh, uh, with PCF and Cloud Foundry, Cloud Native Application Security. Um, it's unique in that we can protect the OS even when the OS can't protect itself. We use tags to simplify the policy administration and visualization, and the crypto just works, right? There's no keys to handle or things to set up. All of that is 100% automated, and this is designed to work on every cloud. It's totally separate of infrastructure, um, and it works on-prem. It works on your public cloud uh, very, very much the same way that Pivotal Cloud Foundry does. And that is my story. I think I have like maybe two or three minutes for some questions. Any questions? You got a question, Bill? Uh, yes. It, uh, so the question was, is this only applicable to data in the cloud? No, it's applicable to any data that's written to disk anywhere. So we do have customers that are starting to encrypt on-prem data, um, and they're doing it to think, think about it, you know, your firewall, your on-prem stuff, why would you not encrypt it to create segmentation? And our view on, on encryption is that encryption is, you know, Eric Snowden, who's arguably like, like the greatest, you know, sort of the source of the greatest breaches of all time, uh, has said himself, the one thing we can trust is properly imp implemented encryption. So encryption is the strongest, most effective security control that's out there. The problem is encryption has been cumbersome and difficult to, to use. Intel is changing that. So Intel makes the crypto operations so fast that we see like one or 2% performance penalty for doing crypto. And then the key management that we work on is 100% automated. So it becomes easy to encrypt. Why would you not encrypt, 
That's kind of our, our, our view. We want to make encryption so easy that like, there's no off switch. Like, it just works, whether it's on-prem or in the cloud. Now, there, there is an off switch. You can turn it off. You don't have to have it. But more and more customers are starting to think, I should start encrypting my data on-prem as well as in the cloud. Yeah, so, so these are good questions. So um, oftentimes the application will have some level of encryption. So you'll do field level encryption. Um, uh, we're doing block level encryption, which means every time the database is writing to disk, we're catching it there. We're catching it at the block level and encrypting. So, the, so from the standpoint of the application, it's just, it's kind of like the disk encryption you have in your laptop. You don't even know it's there, but it's there. So it works perfectly with field level encryption. You're getting double encrypted then. You're, we're encrypting encrypted data, but that's no big deal. It, that, that works just fine. The advantage of doing block level encryption is that it's much, much easier to do at very large scale. Right? Field level encryption requires making sure that it's, it's deployed and the key management and all that stuff has to be dealt with at the application level. Some apps do, some apps don't. Block level, it just works. It's infrastructure. Yes? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the question is, what's the performance impact? We work very, very hard to optimize that. Um, you know, I think a good number to have in your head is ten percent. Um, but with performance, performance is like gas mileage in your car. Your, your mileage may vary. We're doing a very large deployment with uh, uh, one of the big Wall Street banks that's doing uh, Monte Carlo analysis, risk analysis. There we see three percent performance degradation. So almost it's almost immeasurable in the cloud because there's there's certain noise. You know, like if you've if you're a performance person and you measured at Amazon, we see fluctuations of you know, around 10%. Um, but there's some other op operations where we might have higher. So, so it's, it's, you know, it what's that? Yeah, that's, we try to we get into the, the realm of OK. But I just wanted to put the caveat on there as like it's not unconditionally OK. It depends on what, what operations are being done. And we can optimize for that. And we can show you, oh, we got to, you know, there's sometimes different ins instance types and stuff to get around some of the performance issues. But yeah, performance is our number one focus area. Uh, we're, we're exhibiting a booth right around the corner here, and we actually have a demo set up, and you can see a live system if you want. We're uh, very excited about working with Cloud Foundry. We've had a bunch of big deployments, and you know, these two things seem very complementary. So you know, if you've got the attitude of we want to be abstracting out infrastructure, we want to be multi-cloud, and we want the ability to have sort of transparent security, uh, come talk to us. Thank you very much.